Now, I know the common logic. It's the same that Paul was arguing against. If you want people to do what is right, you must give them rules. They must know and keep the divine commandments. Freedom is found by obedience. But freedom is tricky, and Paul seems to argue against plain obedience. In Greek, the word that we translate as freedom or, or liberty is eleutheria. And it seems to come from the roots for arriving, elu, and where one loves, eran. The etymology points at eleutheria, meaning the fulfillment of one's love as a growing and rising process, as advancing to a higher state of being, a process which is never done in isolation. Paul, as he is trying to make clear to the church in Galatia, now thinks of freedom as freedom not just from something, but freedom to something. Now look, I have nothing against rules. Listen, rules can be very, very good. When I'm driving down Northwest Expressway, I'm glad we have rules. That's not a place where I want people expressing their freedom. And think what r rules do for us in here, in the context of worship. When, when Glenda plays for us, she's using rules. She has the freedom to play whatever she wants, but she restricts herself to the rules of that particular song because otherwise we couldn't really join in, could we? I mean, notes on a piano can be a cacophonous mess or a beautiful melody, all because of rules. But those rules are really the boundaries of relationship. They help me to moderate my freedom with yours. Paul is calling people to be transformed into that awareness, obedient because of our freedom, not because of the rules. This new lifestyle has, at its base, a relationship with the God of compassion and goodness rather than static obedience to a set of rules or system of beliefs. That's what results in good living, at least how Paul sees it. Christians, says Paul, need to make this relationship their focus, and like all relationship, it's going to have some rules to it. Just like with our partners or our friends or our family, we don't live by those rules, we live with them. The rules are always subject to love and, and bend with needed when needed. Sometimes they break, and sometimes they break in irreparable ways. But we don't operate our relationships based on the rules. The rules simply act as the boundaries. And let's just be frank here. Paul is not talking about a relationship of equals. He makes it quite clear that we are to be obedient to God's way. His point is that we relate ourselves into that obedience. We don't just obey rules to live out God's love and kindness, and that creates in us a more direct and full connection to God's way of living than any amount of legal observance ever could. Paul spells this out in a very Greek way of thinking, a dualistic example of the spirit and the flesh. Now, Paul was just using a metaphor, but just like with religion, we've taken this too seriously. Paul was a person of Hebrew descent. He did not think like a Greek person. He just understood how they thought, and like any good rhetorician, made his argument using their terms. And what I find interesting is if we were to read the, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version translation, the one that you have in your pews there, you would see this whole argument of spirit and flesh. Peterson doesn't use it at all because he knows that Paul was making a specific argument to a specific group of people using their language, language that doesn't necessarily work for us anymore. Unfortunately, we've made this into a spirit versus flesh argument, as if they are separate things opposed to one another. All that Paul is saying is that the flesh is finite, but spirit infinite. So things that orient us to stuff that, that satisfies temporarily but fades away are of the flesh, they're perishable. But things that orient us towards the infinite are of the spirit. Paul says this many ways. There are things which lead to life and things which lead to death. Following the way of the spirit over the way of the flesh leads to life. It is still possible, after all, to enter a relationship with God and then abandon God's priorities and follow after our own selfish impulses at the expense of others. Just to follow one's impulses and to gratify one's own need without regard for others is to live according to the flesh. Not that our normal human impulses, whether sexual or for food or anything else, are wrong, 
They become wrong when they are handled in such a way that we do harm to others and to ourselves. They are wrong when they become the point, not our connection to the larger whole. Paul offers us a radically different sense of freedom than we have today. The freedom Christ gives is not freedom for self-indulgence, but freedom from self to see a world beyond our own narrow desires, a yoke of slavery that can be brought on by oppression or dedication to the borders surrounding God instead of God, or our own self-indulgence. Desmond Tutu, a man who knows something about figurative and literal prisons, says, the goal of human life is to live beyond the small, narrow prison of our own cares. That's the freedom that Paul wants us to know, and that's the freedom that he asks us not to squander. Our freedom is a sign of our value to God. Since God values and loves us fully, we are given freedom. But just like any relationship, that kind of freedom requires responsibility. We have to recognize that if we are all created equal, as both the biblical and American promises go, then we must see other people's freedom first. That's the only way it works. When we get caught up so much in our own freedom, we end up taking another's away. That's as true for you and I as it is for communities or corporations or nations. Our freedom, no matter how long fought for or well-deserved, can't be held by de depriving other people of theirs. Look, I understand. Freedom is scary. It's nice to think about, but especially when it comes to our own faith journey, we'd, we'd probably like a little more guidance. I mean, having more agency over something we feel so tentative about in the first place isn't really great news, but I believe in that freedom. And I'm not a person who thinks that God has some grand design for people. Oh, maybe there are some people God specifically sets out to do certain things. Author Donald Miller has a great bit about this. He says that if you're wondering if God has a plan for your life, then, then look at the biblical stories. He goes through and he counts up the number of times that God has sort of indicated a plan. It's 277 times by his count. So he says you have about a 1 in 277 chance of God having a plan for your life. And here's some ways to know about that. If a burning bush speaks to you, then you probably need to listen. If you have a dream that you're going to be second in command of Egypt, start paying attention and seek counseling. If you've never had sex and become pregnant, chances are something is up. But for most of us, the pen and paper are set before us. We are to write our own story, and God is giving us the freedom to do so. And that terrifies us because we're afraid we'll get to the end and it'll be like a, a, a bad movie. You know, the ones where the credits start rolling and you say, really? That was it? Paul is very radical in his call for us to stand up in the freedom that Christ has shown us. It involves us being engaged now. We can no longer stand back waiting for God's dramatic call. We have to actually be part of writing our own story. We have to actually use the freedom we have been given to remind or enlighten people about their own freedom. And we have to work to maintain that delicate balance between my freedom and your freedom. Now, I don't know about you, but this 4th of July I have something else to think about. Yes, I'll, I'll watch a parade and I'll see some fireworks. I'll be thinking about something else. In the past I've thought about that declaration of over 200 years ago and what, what freedom means today, but this year... Well, I think I'll be wondering about a declaration from 2,000 years ago and what kind of freedom that means for us today. For economic freedom has not made us free, other than superficially. Political freedom has not made us free, other than superficially. All of these forms of so-called freedom can only gain substance when we see our communal connection where there is a recognition and respect for the fact that all people are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. When we see that God has set us free to live a life of the spirit, so let's make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That's the truth.
the truth that sets us free.